uh, Humanities Montana. And now I get the pleasure of working with him because he's the executive director of the Montana Museum of Art and Culture. Yay. And uh, Raphael is a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, and he is an art artist and an art historian. He is a professor of art history and criticism at the University of Montana. And he lectures on a broad range of art historical subjects. He received his doctorate in art history with honors from the University of Chicago. And he has been awarded numerous fellowships in study in Europe and Spanish Ministry of Culture for his dissertation on, I'm not going to be able to say that, Raphael. Michelangelism. Michelangelism. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, he does these wonderful trips uh, to Europe and to South America where you can go and look at art, and I would love to do that when I retire. So here he is, the great Raphael Shekel. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Save your applause, you may hate this talk, so. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the MPA, the Montana Preservation Alliance, and Cher Justo, and also Ellen Crane, and this wonderful institution that I have loved for many, many years. Um, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and to, uh, to have the privilege and the honor to participate in a workshop like this, uh, to learn. I, I, I learned so much from watching last week's uh, gatherings on video and then uh, hearing uh, these wonderful members of this community talk about their families and their histories and their connections to this, uh, this marvelous place. Um, Butte is, for me, it's like a second home. And in a minute I'll tell you why, why I have such a, a, an affection for this, uh, for this city. Uh, but first I want to point out this article here. We actually talked about these articles earlier this morning. Uh, they date from the eight, uh, early 80s uh, here in, in, in Butte. I think these are from the standard. Uh, and what they show us is um, a couple of the, the activism that existed in the Mexican community in the, uh, in the early 80s. Uh, the one on the right is kind of interesting, and I, I got a kick out of reading this, because I, as a historian, whenever I start doing research on uh, particular historical characters, I feel like I start channeling them. And I was, I was reading this article. This is about a professor at the University of Montana. His name was Manuel Machado, Manny Machado, who taught history at the University of Montana for many years. And he came to speak here, oh god, in 1981, and nothing has changed. I feel like I'm channeling Manny Machado here. But what he said, actually, at that point was that 43% of uh, the Hispanics in the state of Montana identify themselves as Mexican. That means that there's all these other Hispanics in the state who don't identify themselves uh, at all, or are, are not at all connected to their, uh, their ancestry and their history. And yet, it, at that point, he was actually bemoaning the fact that, that there were so few people in Butte. And as you can see from the article, Butte Hispanics told to become active. He was encouraging them to, uh, to organize, to preserve their history, to, uh, to not to lose their stories, not to, not to lose their ethnic identity, uh, and that was in 1981. And I think we're still about that business. And I think this workshop, uh, these workshops that we're doing are, are really all about that, because our richness as a nation is indeed based on, uh, on, on our, ver our diversity, the variety of, of origin stories, um, and we find, when we start talking to each other, we realize how much we have in common, actually and how much we share. And when, and when you come to a city like Butte, you realize um, how much these stories intersect and how these ethnic communities really made Butte the great city that it is. So, um, so it's a privilege. I'm not Mexican. I'm Cuban. I'm a part of the, the great Hispanic family. But, um, but I feel very close to, to Mexico, and, and there's, a, there's a couple reasons for that. I was born in Cuba. I was just telling Bob here that I was born and almost bred uh, I was born in Cuba in 1963, and my family came out in 1970, came over to the States. Um, we were refugees, we were immigrants, and my father became a steel worker. But before coming to, to uh, the United States, we lived in Mexico. So as a seven-year-old kid, my, Mexico was the first foreign culture that I experienced as a child. 
And I, I, I went to school in Mexico, and it was, it was similar, but it was so radically different from my homeland, that little island in the Caribbean. Uh, and so Mexico was sort of imprinted on me since I was a, a young child. I also grew up, and, and, and this next piece may explain why I, I have such an affection for Butte. I grew up in northwest Indiana. I grew up in a town called Hammond, Indiana, uh, literally one block away from uh, South Chicago. So Chicago is literally on the other side of, of, uh, of, uh, of our block, our street. And that, that community in northwest Indiana was a working class community, mostly attached to the steel industry and sometimes the oil refineries that were there, or the railroad industry. Because all those rail lines from the east and the south had to go through Hammond, Indiana to get it to South Chicago. And in those communities, which were, you know, they tended to be progressive communities, very ethnic, I grew up with, uh, we used to joke, I grew up with lats, lits, ukes, poles, cubes, mechs, PRs. I mean, they were, it was a whole panoply of ethnic communities. And the Cubans were a very, very, very small minority of that. The, the largest Hispanic group in that part of, of Indiana and that part of that continuum of, around Chicago was Mexican. And so I grew up eating those tortillas and those mole and, uh, and the empanadas and all that great food. I mean, I, 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 this morning hearing about your families talking about food, I was just salivating the whole time. And believe me, I wasn't thinking about those rolls. I was thinking about those homemade tortillas, which I haven't had in years. But uh, so Mexico, uh, for me, has, very, has been very much a part of my life. My, my whole childhood was really spent with uh, Mexican friends and Mexican families. And they, it was almost like a second home uh, to me. Um, when I was in graduate school, I, I had a scam. Let me tell you about my scam, um, which involved Mexico directly. I, uh, I had friends who were Mexican, mostly from Mexico City, from the capital. And back then, there was a little airline called Midway Airlines based in Chicago, and they flew out of Midway Airport down on the south side. And they had $100 tickets to Mexico City. Because you know, Chicago is one of the world's largest Hispanic cities. It's one of the largest Mexican cities in the world. Millions of, of people there uh, identify with Hispanic heritage, and a lot of those are Mexicans. Well, my friends and I figured out that if we, if we booked a flight on Midway Airlines to Mexico City, on Friday night, at, it was a, I think it was the six o'clock flight. We'd get bumped off because that was everybody wanted to go to Mexico. You know, everybody who needed to go back to Mexico wanted that flight. You know, the businessman's flight or whatever. And if you got bumped off that flight, they would give you a free. And the flights, by the way, were a hundred bucks. Hundred bucks from Chicago to Mexico City. And if you got bumped, you got a free flight. So we would just go, we would intentionally get bumped, we'd take the 9 o'clock flight, which means we'd get into Mexico City at about 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, which is perfect time to go to the bars in Mexico City. And then we had a free ticket, so we'd come back the next week and do the same thing. And so for about three years in graduate school, I was going to Mexico City every weekend. <laughs> and we would just literally go there, and we'd have a great time, and we'd check out the museums. And, 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 and So it was a, it was a, a wonderful little scam, and, and too bad. It, I, I mean, that's probably why Midway Airlines closed. Because <laughs> they got on to us after a while. Anyway, so uh, so Mexico is is has been a very much a part of my um, of my um, my origin story. Uh, the fact that that Mexico sheltered my family uh, on its passage to the United States um, makes me feel a certain solidarity with uh, with all those refugees and all those immigrants who have also come to America by way of Mexico. Um, uh, it's it's a it's a great country, and if I were if I were Mexican, I'd be very proud to be Mexican. So it's amazing heritage. We were looking at these mortar pestles, and I think Leo brought in a wooden one, and Phyllis brought in a stone one, and I kept thinking, you know, that humble object, that molcajete, right, that, that, uh, that your grandmothers and your aunts uh, ground their chilies in, it has an ancient history, an ancient rich history that combines the European heritage that brought by the Spanish Empire to this continent, but also the indigenous history of this continent. You can see those metates, those ancient uh, uh, mortar pestles that go back 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years. 
So think about you know, how, how the Mexican community is not only tied to its European heritage, but also to its indigenous American heritage. Great civilizations just south of our border in, uh, in the United States. So I would be very, very proud to be Mexican and to be claimed by the Mexican community. So what I want to do th uh, this, uh, this morning is first acknowledge the folks who are here uh, who have Hispanic heritage and who are doing their best to keep that heritage alive and well and working with the archives, uh, recording their stories, bringing in their artifacts, their family albums, their family pictures, uh, passing those things on to the next generation and, and, and future generations so that that story isn't lost. Uh, one of the things that Manny Machado uh, bemoans here is that, uh, that we're losing the community through integration and, and, and assimilation. And, and while that's good, and, and earlier generations, and, and by the way, all, all of Butte's ethnic communities experience this. Um, if you were Italian, you had the option of being Italian, and being proud of being Italian, or losing your Italian heritage. And that means losing the food and losing the language and losing the, cult, the cultural glues that hold your, your people together. And a lot of our communities have suffered that great losses and lost connections. And so then you find the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren having to travel back to Sicily or northern Italy or wherever to re somehow reconnect because the parents, either by force or by will, lost that, those, those ties. So what I think, what, what I see you doing in this community is I think very precious and important work, and that is to make sure that those ties aren't lost. And, and that, and it's Butte's history, it's not just your own ethnic community's history, it's not just your family's history. The potential is that Butte could lose this history. And so I'm, I'm really happy to see how, how active this community is in cultivating its roots, understanding where we come from, understanding what makes this city special and what makes us unique in the state of Montana. Um, so congratulations and press on because this is really good and very important work. So uh, so what I want to do for the rest of this, uh, this, this talk, and actually and mostly I want to hear from you, so I'm going to open up for, for Q&A for uh, for questions here shortly, but what I want to do is I want to go back, and by the way, I have to uh, give credit here, this a PowerPoint was put together by uh, by Cher Justo, who you see over there. I stole uh, all the pictures. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of these pictures and a lot of the newspaper clippings that you see here actually come from uh, the archives, yes. which uh, are uh, it's quite a rich collection of, of materials. But, I want to go back to some of these earlier uh, images here, and, and Cher, by the way, presented half of these images last week. I'm going to focus mostly on the second half of her PowerPoint, and maybe the archives can actually make this PowerPoint available to you as well if you're, if you're interested. Um, but anyway, I want to go back to uh, a couple of images, let's see, that she talked about last week. And uh, here we go, getting very close, getting warm, here we go. Okay, so what I want to talk about is sort of the broad patterns of Hispanic immigration, particularly the Mexican community's immigration to, uh, uh, to this city, and to talk about the connections uh, that were built here and, and, and to what extent it parallels the, uh, the, the patterns that we see among other ethnic communities in Butte. Uh, so there is a, there is a there are the stories, the local stories of individual families, but then there's also the bigger, the bigger story of migration uh, in this country and specifically in this city. And of course, that migration is mostly tied to mining. It is the, the city's dominant industry. It's what drew a lot of ethnic communities here starting in the 19th century, the late 19th century, but continuing into the 20th century. For the Mexican community, the 20th century, the early 20th century is really the time when, when we see large numbers of Mexicans coming, uh, coming to work in, in the mines. So um, the, the majority of Mexicans seem to have come here after World War I. So you do see in some of the records, you do see evidence of Hispanics here. They're mostly at that point identified as Spaniards in Butte in the 1880s, in the 1890s, very, very small number of people from Spain and other parts of Latin America. So you might find in the, in the, in the roles a Uruguayan or a Paraguayan or a, or a renegade Cuban or whatever, but you don't see large numbers of Hispanics, particularly Mexicans, until after World War I. 
And of course, that's pro there's probably a reason for that, and that is that the war itself, the Butte becomes a boom town during the war. And if you think about the copper from the city sort of fueling, the, being the major metal required for the war effort during World War I, Butte needed miners. And so miners came here from Mexico in the 1920s. Uh, in that early, in the early 1920s, in that uh, after after World War One, and and to what extent they came here legally or illegally, we don't know, uh, but but we do know that that uh, that the names Mexican names appear on company rolls in huge numbers. They appear in the newspaper uh, in the newspaper accounts uh, in large numbers. And here are some of those names: Calzadillas, Juarez, Gloria, Guerrero, Garcia, Morales. Montoya, Romero, Chavez, Anayo, Ramirez, Lopez, Munoz. It just goes on and on and on. It's almost as if Mexico was, in fact, contributing to this, this society in a very, very big way, starting in the 20s and throughout the 1930s and up through World War II. There's no evidence, by the way, that they came as part of programs like the Braceros program that was a, a kind of a, a, a wave of legal immigration in the, 19, in the late 40s and in, into the 1950s. They were mostly coming because they heard about the mines and they heard that there was work here. So the mines were drawing them, as they were lots of other ethnic communities from around the world. But it's noticeable that they came. A lot of them came by way of the southern states. So some of them worked in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona. And that's also pretty apparent from the documents. I was just talking to Kitty Robbins in Missoula this morning, and she was telling me that her family, and this is, a, this is another interesting aspect to the story that we probably haven't explored yet, um, that her family were Irishmen, miners from Ireland, who actually in the 1890s first went to Mexico, and it was from Mexico that they, they came here to Butte. Now, isn't that interesting? And I've always been sort of interested in the Irish communities in Mexico. If you go to Mexico, there are Irish names everywhere. O'Higgins and O'Gormans and you know, O'Reilly's. Why are these Irish names in Mexico? It's because Ireland, popula Ireland seems to have populated the world <laughs> in the 19th century. But it's also interesting that the Irish went to Mexico looking for work. And often, miners from Ireland wound up in Mexico and then wound up here in Butte. How many of the, the Butte Irish didn't have a stint or a period in Mexico? And may have been actually part of the same migration, people coming up from the south to work here in, in the mines. So in the 1920s and 30s, uh, the newspaper accounts, the records actually show that the Mexican community was concentrated on the east side of the city, although it was interesting to hear Leo talk about in her day as a child, uh, that actually families moved around quite a bit, um, following mine work throughout throughout the city. But at least earlier, in the first half of the 20th century, they seem to have been concentrated on East Park and East Galena in that neighborhood, and mostly around this church. And that's why uh, Kate's image is so important here. And this is the Church of Sacred Heart. And here we see it actually as it was being demolished. And that church is now gone, and it was uh, actually, this whole area is, is, now, is now gone. But this is where the Mexican community was, uh, was established. Um, and there are, in the newspaper accounts, you know that there were institutions here that really catered to the Mexican community. Uh, there were bars uh, and restaurants. Uh, let's see, the three bars that, uh, that, uh, that Cher was able to identify were the Mexicali, uh, the uh, the New Mexico Bar, these were owned by, by Mexican families, by the Bastidas family, um, and uh, the, the New Mexico was. Uh, the Mexicali Bar was owned by the Fonseca family. And then there was another bar called the Silver King or Silver City Bar, and that was an African-American bar. But it seemed to, its primary patrons seemed to have been Mexicans. So you have these three bars, but there were also cafes here on the east side. I don't know if, if these names ring a bell. El, El Patio, the patio. There was the Tia Juana's Chili Parlor, uh, was identified in the 1930s, I believe. So there were, there were institutions here as well. And now, because this community, because the neighborhood itself is gone, we've sort of lost that story. Uh, and because these communities dispersed, and they dispersed throughout the city. There's another reason why um, uh, folks dispersed. The, the miners who came here in the 1920s and the 1930s tended to be hard rock miners. 
they were undergrounders. And they were highly desirable. And in fact, all evidence shows us that they were good miners. They were coming in from Mexico. And actually, let me, let me scroll down to, uh, to Cher's images of where those mining communities were in Mexico. But there are these very important um, mining sites throughout Mexico that, that seem to have populated uh, Butte's mines as well. So let me just quickly scroll through here. And here we go. OK, actually, these are some images uh, that uh, Cher picked together. Uh, the migrants to, to the United States from Mexico tended to be of two types. They tended to be agricultural workers, very poor, um, uh, in many cases illiterate. They were, they were the, the, the poorest um, uh, immigrants. They were also, but a lot of them were also attached to major industries like railroad or, or the mining industry. Okay, so here are some of those mining towns in Mexico. And here you see, in fact, the states where you had um, uh, the largest uh, mines, San Luis Potosí, Zacatecas, Durango, Chihuahua. And so, uh, so these, these maps actually show us where the majority of the, the mines were in Mexico and where most of the Mexicans who came to work the mines uh, were likely to have come from. So, uh, so these communities, in fact, came up here. They established themselves. They created lives just like any other communities. And in fact, they found gainful employment in the mines. And they experienced what every other community experienced in those mines. So that means hard work, labor strife, um, in some cases, a good living. You know, they worked their ways up. It's interesting when you read the oral histories how, uh, how what they experience is what everybody else was experiencing. Very, very similar, similar kinds of stories. In some cases in those oral histories, I think it was with Dan Aguilar, where they, they asked him point blank, um, you know, did you face discrimination in the mines? And his argument was like, no, not really. No more discrimination than the next guy. And so I, I kept thinking about my own father working in the steel mills in East Chicago, Indiana, or Hammond, Indiana, and, and you know how. My dad said that once you entered the mill, everybody was the same. I mean, you were either like you were either working labor or you were management or everybody and, and everybody had each other's back. Everybody was protecting each other. So the level of discrimination, if it existed, you know, it was mitigated by the fact that everybody was in fact working in the same, everybody had the same goals. They wanted to educate their kids, they wanted to feed their families, they wanted to have a better life than what they had had previous. Everybody came to these places with a, with a, a home country and, and poor circumstances. So, um, so those miners um, had a, share amount of res a, a fair amount of respect as, uh, because they brought some skills from Mexico and because they worked very hard. And I think that's also very apparent when you, when you uh, uh, read these histories and when you go into the archival material. These folks worked very hard. And, uh, and the other communities respected them for that. Some of that evidence also appears when the pit opened and when miners moved from underground, working underground, to working above ground. And there are accounts where the managers at the pit were looking for Mexican miners because they trusted them, because the other workers knew that they had a good reputation. So that means basically almost half a century of working underground was then, you know, was what they were resting on when they actually started working in, in the pit. The pit also had the impact of, of scattering a lot of the community. So imagine with the, you know, with the loss of the east side and the communities over there, that the Mexican community was actually more diffused in, in the state. And it wasn't actually until then, until the late 70s and the early 80s, when I think there was a kind of resurgence of Hispanic identity all across America. And maybe it's linked to Cesar Chavez in, in, uh, in California, um, sort of the, con the, the raising of consciousness among this community that felt that it was discriminated against on many, many levels in housing and jobs or whatever, um, that those folks actually began to organize here in, uh, in Montana. And you start seeing in, in, uh, in, in the newspaper accounts in the 1980s uh, particularly the early 80s, a kind of new consciousness developing in the community. By then, you have to remember the community had been scattered. It had lost its kind of like its home base. And so 
uh, el centro de la raza, which was the center of the culture or the race, uh, as it was called, was really an attempt to, um, to reorganize or bring the community back together. So I want to talk now a little bit about um, how that happened. And, and, and a lot of that work, didn't, it didn't just start in the, or in the 80s. In the 70s, there were also some attempts to do that, to bring the community back together. From what I can see in the, in the newspaper accounts, a lot of that was sort of cultural activities. It wasn't political in the 70s. A lot of it was just having meals, events, parties uh, with a Mexican theme. And that's interesting because you know the things that we identify with culture are often uh, customs like the quinceanera when, when girls turn 15, you know, they dress up, it's sort of like the debutante, the coming out party. Uh, so you see announcements for quinceañeras, um, food, events related to food, uh, and then religious holidays, particularly December 12th. Now, why is December 12th such a big date in the Mexican community? Our Lady, our Lady of Guadalupe. And our, it seems that sometime in the late 60s, early 70s, Our Lady of Guadalupe becomes very popular, not just in Mexican communities, but all over the United States. And maybe it's connected to Vatican too. I don't know, it's, uh, I, I'm speculating now. But what you start seeing is shrines to Our Lady of Guadalupe being uh, put up in many Catholic churches, some with Mexican communities, some with Hispanic communities, but others are just because she becomes very popular in that period. Well, you start seeing that in Butte in the 70s. So December 12th, around, if you look up what's going on in Butte, December 12th, any number of churches were hosting events related to, to Our Lady of Guadalupe. Mostly um, mass and then a meal, and that usually a Mexican uh, Mexican uh, meal. Yeah? So when we grew up, uh, and around the time period, like when I was a child into like maybe high school, and I can't remember when they stopped, but we had our fiestas mm -hmm. at St. Joe's. And St. Joe's would have a mass. Uh, a lot of times it was Father Pedro Barone. Yes, I was just going to talk about Father yeah. Pedro. Yes. And so he would conduct the mass, and then we would have our fiesta. And of course, there were pinatas, and then just a multitude of, you know, Spanish foods. And it was it was part of you know our growing up. And know? was that in the seventies or the eighties? Uh, it was probably. I, I was a smaller child, and I let's say I graduated high school. In, you know, I'm not trying to figure out how old you are, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I am. That's <laughs> been when I was, you know, like a younger person. Yeah. So probably through maybe. Do you, does anybody remember the fiestas and like when? It they was the late 70s. Yes. It was the late 70s. Yeah, I thought it was. And anyway, um, you know, I remember them stopping, and it was so, you know, it was so part of our growing up, yeah. you know, to have those fiestas every year. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. And that so was like uh, the mines closed down. Yes. That's right. That's so true. so so there's another there's another connection there. The mines were closing down and, and so it was another way of community building in kind of under duress, you know. Uh, so that's that's really wonderful. And and you mentioned Father Pedro uh, uh, Barone. He was actually in Missoula at St. Anthony's Church in the seventies. And he but he would come to Butte, I think, to connect with the Mexican community here. He was actually from San Bernardino, from California, and but I think he felt very much at home in the Mexican community here, was received well, and then eventually came to parish here. I mean, actually to, to uh, uh, so he became, uh, and it was, it was when he was here in Butte that he actually helped to stoke and to catalyze the Centro de la Raza. And that actually was a community center for the Mexican community, <coughs> and it was political. I mean, its whole point was in fact to, uh, uh, to organize the community politically as well as socially, to, to do all those events, those cultural events, the glues that held the community together, but also to, uh, to actually to protect and defend people's rights. Um, so he's an instrumental figure, and, and he's a, he seems to have been a very important figure here in, <coughs> in the 1980s, particularly with that, that center. I don't know, does anybody know how the center uh, cl closed or how it ended? Anybody have any of that, that history? There was basically disinterest. It was disinterest because the Mexican population wanted to do that. They didn't want, They were afraid to talk about discrimination. If you went to uh, families, they were afraid to talk about it. They like, leave it alone. They're going to cause trouble. So 
Yeah, so, so and, and that's another thing I, uh, I also learned from the Mexican community in, in, um, in Northwest Indiana, is that oftentimes people just kept their noses to the grindstone and they kept, they were down below the radar. Right. They, they literally just wanted to work and they wanted to keep their families and their churches and their communities intact, but they really weren't about to get involved politically, become active. Um, you know, and, and I'll just tell you a little bit, we, we can't lump all Hispanics together because we all come from different, different countries, different heritage. And even among the, the Hispanics that I knew really well growing up, the Mexicans, the Puerto Ricans, and the Cubans, we were all very different. And we had a very different status uh, in terms of like the way the government and the dominant culture saw us. Um, Puerto Ricans were American citizens. So they had benefits that none of the rest of us had. We had to go through a naturalization process. They were not illegals. They were legally here because they were American citizens. And to a certain extent, they benefited from that relationship. Cubans were um, symbols. We were sort of uh, poster children for the Cold War. Any Cuban who came to the United States was greeted with open arms. We were like desirables because we were at mostly anti-communist. My parents were refugees from a communist country. Anybody who fled, and this is like why my dad got along so well with the Poles and with the Ukrainians and the Lithuanians and the Russians and all those people in the steel mills in Northwest Indiana because they all shared, they were all refugees from communist countries and during the Cold War, the United States loved those people. So Cubans were beloved by the American government because we were good symbols of the, our war, our fight against uh, communism, global communism. So Cubans had a different status. Mexicans, Guatemalans, El Salvadorians, all those folks actually were a notch below. Why is that? Because they were dirty Mexicans, they were not respected in the same way that these other Hispanics were. And I don't know how, to what extent that was true here in, in Butte, but I know it was definitely true in Chicago and in Northwest Indiana. It's true here. It was true here. So, so um, you know, we have to be honest about this history. It's a mixed history. It's a mixed bag. It's um, uh, these communities, and and it's interesting how some communities that were where their folks and their grandparents had been discriminated against, they were now turning around and discriminating against the newest arrivals. Right. So actually, uh, I think it was your Phil. Uh, it's your mom, actually, in her oral history that she talks about how um, when the Mexicans came to Butte in the 1920s, they displaced blacks. Blacks had been discriminated against. They were the miners before them. Then the Mexicans replaced them, and then somebody was beating up on them. So, I mean, this is a, it's, it's a recurring pattern in American history. So, uh, so not to be, you know, not to whitewash this history, we have to be kind of honest that the history also came with a certain degree of pain and indignity, uh, you know, and, and mistreatment. So, but the other thing that's also remarkable about Butte is how assimilation took place here, how uh, people worked together, how communities across ethnic heritage worked together, how they protected each other. I think you've all experienced that. Uh, across communities, people know and respect and love and take care of each other. And that's really what makes, I think, this place exceptional. Um, uh, we don't have, you know, ghettos like uh, other, other cities across America have. I mean, it's a, it's a, di a very, very different mindset. It's one more of a collective, um, collective cooperation and, and taking care of each other than, than in fact, discrimination. Okay, so that's uh, the, the period through the 1980s. I'm not quite sure what has happened since then, but, um, but I'm very happy to see this effort as a way of kind of reconnecting folks and, and to talk across, um, you know, across this history, which is, a, I think, a rich and, and, and wonderful history. Um, I was noticing, too, how many of folks in the Mexican community have married into other communities. How many of you have, uh, have Anglo-Saxon last names or German last names, you know, either through marriage or your kids have gone on and, and married? Um, uh, it works. I mean, this is the, the melting pot story, right? That, that America, we have created a kind of a new identity. Your kids have a different identity from your identity. You had a different identity from your folks' identity. If your parents were, in fact, ashamed of their heritage or kept their, their language at home, they didn't speak Spanish beyond the, the, the front door of the house, 
uh, it's different for, for you and for your, your, your descendants. Uh, it's a, it's a very different kind of age. Let me tell you one little vignette about coming to America. When I, was, uh, when I came to America, uh, one of the first things we asked our aunt, and this is when we arrived uh, from, we flew from Laredo, Texas to Detroit, Michigan, where most of my father's family was concentrated. And I remember asking my aunt Marcy, uh, asking her, what is my name in English? And my first name is Hippolito, spelled with an H, like Hippolito, right? And she goes, oh, I'm sorry. There is no translation here. <laughs> wow. I mean, all my, my other siblings, well, their names translated easily into English. Mine didn't translate at all. But then here's what happened to me when I went to uh, my first, uh, my second grade classroom. I arrived in the classroom, and Mrs. Thomas, God rest her soul, wherever she is, because I don't really know whether she went to up there or down there. <laughs> Mrs. Thomas said to me, you're in America now. Your name is Ralph. <laughs> so Rafael became Ralph. And my sister said to me, you know, that's never a good name. Not even before it meant to throw up. You know? <laughs> So I, you know, so names are important, and if you're Maria, you're not the same as Mary. You know, it's a different identity, and, it, and your identity changes. When my elementary school friends know me as Ralph, they can't conceive of me as Rafael. Um, so it, it makes a difference, and, but it tells, you the, it tells you the kind of pressures, social pressures mostly, that we experience as immigrants. And I think, you know, if I, if, I, if I talk to anybody who is either an immigrant or a, re a refugee from another country whose family has, uh, has had to assimilate and become a part of America, we all have these similar stories. How many, how many German Americans didn't have to change their names in Montana in the 1920s because of the Sedition Act? Because there was such hatred of Germans in Montana. So we've, we've experienced similar, similar stories. You wanted to oh, say I something. I was just kind of laughing because I have an aunt and her name is Pro, I think it's Pro, Prometheus Solemnia. I, I believe that was, was the pronunciation. But we called her Aunt Patsy. And then my um, uncle's name was Urbano, and we called him Bunny. So we had an Uncle Bunny, and everybody thought that was just like very strange. And my sister's name was Barbara. Mine's Anna, Anna Maria. But my sister's name was Barbara, and we called her Bobby. So one year, friends made some uh, dyed Easter eggs for us, and one of them said Roberta on the egg, and we all went, like, who in the heck is Roberta? And we didn't realize, you know, Bobby is sometimes the nickname for the name Roberta. Yeah. So this woman had made us an Easter egg with my sister's name as Roberta. Yeah, so. And did Bunny get his Easter egg? <laughs> So he lived in Washington State, so he didn't get his Easter egg. But yeah, we had an Uncle Bunny, and, and everybody used to think that was just really I mean, I'm not ashamed to be called Ralph. But, you know, it's not my given name. I mean, and and, and I, I am different when I'm Ralph. Usually I'm drinking a lot of beer. <laughs> yes, Rafael drinks wine. Uh, Ralph drinks beer. Cheap beer. <laughs> and sometimes he ices it down in the summertime. It's just really very bad But anyway, I'm curious to hear from, from those of you folks. Did any of your families change their names? Like change their their the the, the last names from what to what? Well, Ugrin, U G R I N, and my father was Ogrin, O G R I N. Huh. So he changed it from Ugrin to Ogrin. But not us. Me, and my mother, my brothers and sisters, we were all Ugrins. His dad was Ugrin, his mother, and him and uh, two of my two of his brothers. They went by Ogrin, and I think. Was to kind of Anglicanize it and move more towards Irish. Oh, grin. Right, right. But right till he died, he was over. What about the, the Hispanic folks? How about the way you pronounce your names? Should be, instead of Acevedo, it should be Acevedo. That's right. Acevedo. 
It should be Acevedo, and everybody pronounces it here. Ace, Acevedo. 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 Yeah. <laughs> By the way, my given name is Hipólito Rafael Chacón Martínez Ramos Castillo. Oh, Just call me Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you of Spanish descent then? Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm Cuban. My you grandmother, my. Uh, my paternal grand grandmother uh, is the only one of her generation born in America. They were her siblings were all born in Spain, Spain, northern Spain. Yeah. So my folks on my dad's side are from northern Spain. Mm -hmm. Folks on my mother's side are from the Canary Islands. Mm -hmm. So they're, in Cuba, they would call them Canarios, Canaries. You know. So yeah. And what year did you immigrate to the United States? Yeah, my family left in 1970. My immediate family. Some of my relatives left in the early 60s, like right after the, uh, the Castro Revolution, so 50, 58, 59, 60, 61. Uh, we came out in 70. And then there's the next batch came out uh, in 1980 during the, uh, the, bo the boat, boat lift crisis, so the Mariel boat lift, yeah. And were your family, were they uh, merchants and uh, the higher echelon in Cuba at that point? No, they were. I would say they were. They were working class people. My grandfather was on one side was a businessman. He owned a shop, a store. On my uh, on my mother's side, they were bakers. So they had bakeries. So they were just working class folks. Uh, nothing too highfalutin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the, in the 1950s, when I was in high school, I worked for a grocery store, Savoir's Grocery, which was on Park Street. And it just oh, your sister was telling me about that. Yeah. And so, so one of the things that, uh, in the grocery store, one of my jobs was uh, is to pick up the sign overs. So, the, the company, the men were allowed to sign over their check. So I go pick up. It was a pretty good bundle of checks, and a lot of them were they living in hotels, and a lot of them were Mexican. And then they come in the store and they take money for their rent or. And some of them would come in only give me ten dollars, and yet, and if he came back and he was drinking, you couldn't give him any money. But it was a it, and jalapeno peppers, fresh jalapeno peppers were there. So there was, and there were red peppers. There were all it was a Greek store. There was Greek food, and then there was all the Spanish or, or Mexican food for, and, and and they liked the, you know, like you have in supermarkets. This was, I guess, the culture store. And the other thing it was, stores were closed on Sunday in those days, but he was open on Sunday. So you'd have, you'd have, it was a regular clientele that would shop there. And a lot of them were living in rooms, uh, men that were just up here working. And uh, it, it was, uh, it, it was a real cultural place for different ethnic groups. But this, I love the sign over checks because, <laughs> That you was, got to that see was a cross section that was their of the bank. community. That yeah. was their bank. Yeah, it was their bank. That yeah. was their bank. Yeah. And that's how they controlled their their money. And, and then that's how some of it gets. I don't know how they sent it home, but uh, there was that's a way they did that. All I had to do was pick the checks up. And if anybody came in, you would have a list that you can't give these guys any money if they come in drinking. And right. then they come back the next day, oh, thank God you didn't give me any money. <laughs> So that's such that's such a beautiful story, you know. This idea that here you have a Greek grocery store, right, and it's carrying all this products for the Mexicans, right? All that stuff, yeah. You know, I want to follow up on uh, Father Barone, and and I have a question regarding that. He was a Carol with us in the late '60s, middle '60s, to correct me. Anyway, and I can still remember. He was an outstanding drummer. I mean, yeah, he was a drummer. I remember And that. he actually, uh, the rumor had it that he played in Vegas. Huh. But anyway, my question was that, and I know he's deceased now and all that kind of stuff, but he, he seemed to be not, he seemed to be a person that people rallied around. Yeah. Like you talked talk about him. Missoula, you talked about Butte, you talked about things, and he, for those of you that don't know him, you know, it would be interesting to do a, a history on how he got to, in the diocese. I think he was a priest at the time, wasn't he? Yeah. And, and he, I remember him, he was a, 
he was a big guy. Yeah, he was huge. He was a big man, and, and we had these musical things going on at Carroll, and he was the star of that. You know, and, and I think he was a priest at the time, so then maybe Bishop Hunthausen brought him here and all that. But, you know, the activities that went on where he went could have been, he was the catalyst to do a lot yeah, of things. Sounds like it, yeah. Anybody else have memories of, of uh, Father Pedro? Yeah, Father, Father Barone uh, and my wife is from Ireland. They had a great relationship. With, and he, he was, he was a charismatic guy. And, and what happened, I think, is part of the thing is he had kidney failure. Mm -hmm. and, and he was on dialysis. And then, you know, he, he got transferred to hell when it was for the dialysis. And I think that's when his influence started waning is when he got kidney failure. And yeah, because he does was, appear in, in the documentation also as being in Helena, but I didn't know that was later. The reason he was Helena yeah, was, was on dialysis. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and, it, and that, but when, when he did get the kidney failure is when, when he got weaker. Do you know anything about his roots? Yeah, anybody. He was a priest. Frank, you if, were if I remember right, he was a priest later in life because he was a party boy. He told me that. You know? <laughs> yeah, I can believe that he told you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he was Something very, you held in I common, right? He had, he had, he had, he had lives away from being a priest, but he came to be a priest later in life. Yeah. And he yeah. was a really. And he was. Yeah, you probably have never seen pictures or anything, but he was. He probably weighed close to 300 pounds. Yeah, he, was, yeah. he was tall and. Beach. But he could do things with a drumstick yeah. that was that we, we were all fascinated with it. I know, and yeah, if he took over uh, an assembly or something, he would he would always be the star. But he was a humble man too. And I could see where a, a parish or something would rally around like him at at the Guadalupe festivals or something right. like that. Right. Yeah. When I moved here, he was just kind and gentle priest. And so one day I asked him, I said, how come the Irish priests are not as nice as you? Because <laughs> this was all Irish priest country. And one day he came in, I was working at a store, and a lady sold tickets to the community concert. And he wrote a letter to the Folklora Ballet of Mexico who were coming to Butte. He just wanted to go backstage and meet him. Well, they thought he was offering a reception. <laughs> and he just didn't know what to do. But the women of the parish put on a great reception that night. And it was it was just outstanding because they all loved him so much. And what was his parish? Was it St. Saint, Saint Saint Joe's? St. Joe's, OK. You have any memories of, of Father Burrow? Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. He was actually you know, pretty good friends with my parents. <coughs> And I would say when he was at Carroll, he was probably in his late twenties, early thirties. That would be, in, and that would be in, in the middle sixties when he we were able to. One of the one of the uh, ideas that we were we've been sort of. Uh, dancing around and testing out, you know, in this workshop is the idea that really it's the Catholic Church that in some ways kept this community together, that it gave the community its identity. And I'm, I'm curious to hear if, 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 I know you're a heathen, so that you may not be able to answer the question, but I wonder to what extent um, the rest of you feel that that may have been true, that, that it was really the religious identity and actually that the Catholic Church not only provided a place for the, the Mexican community to worship, but it also allowed them to also find brothers and sisters in other communities. You know, that, that uh, especially after Sacred Heart, you know, was, was raised, that, um, you know, the Mexican community went into other Catholic parishes throughout the city and had to find homes there. So that the church really was the glue in some ways that held the held the, the community together. I'm just wondering if, if you want to speak to that idea. I think that's definitely true with a lot of the Hispanic population. They they believed in the Catholic Church. That was one. And you're right, it was Sacred Heart, St. Joe's, that's what I remember. Yeah, I went to Sacred Heart and I went to well, I went to church every single day. I had um, Father Taylor and Father Fleming. Father Fleming was a, a young priest. Father Taylor was an 
awesome, awesome priest. Um, we used to go to um, Father, we used to go to the parish on Halloween and he would give us pennies for trick or treat. And Father Fleming, he was the younger priest and he would have a fishing hat with tackle in his hat, and which was unusual in the 50s. Um, and then when they, when we had to move from East Mercury Street, we had to go down to um, South Gaylord, and we went to St. John's. Um, well, there was one incident when I was going to church. Um, we would walk from Mercury Street to St. Sacred Heart, and it was really, really cold, and um, Mrs. Rodriguez was yelling at me, calling me her daughter, which was Gloria, and I was running because she kept saying, come back, come back, come back, and I was running to the church, and I was crying when I got to the church. Father Fleming, I was telling him my story, that the lady was yelling at me to come back, and she was mistaking me for her daughter, and Father Fleming calmed me down and told me that people do make mistakes when I was a young girl, but um, when I had to move to um, the South District on, on um, Gaylord Street and went to St. John's, um, the priest came to our house. We had five girls in our family and one boy. And um, the priest came to our house and I asked him if I could join sacristy. We couldn't go to, to Central because um, we couldn't afford the um, tuition. So I had to go to East Junior High. And so I asked the priest if I could join sacristy and he says, no, only Central kids can um, <laughs> do sacristy. Well, I was pretty upset because I used to do sacristy at um, Sacred Heart. So I stopped going to church every single day and I only went on Sundays. But um, I always went to church. Now I go to um, St. Pat's Church, but I always kept God in, in my heart and I still go to church, keep my children, grandchildren with me and go to church. But I think Sacred Heart, going to church, going to um, Sacred Heart School, Sacred Heart Church had a lot to do with it. Father Taylor, Father Fleming had a lot to do with it too. The sisters definitely. <laughs> oh, the sisters. I had, I had a really good, ex I had to go to catechism, that's when I started, like, eh, I don't think that. But the nuns were always nice to me. No, Actually, the, the nuns, nuns were not right. nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> you were lucky, oh, Phyllis. Oh, oh. Let's not go that way, folks. Let's not have Pandora's box here. <laughs> my, my, following up on what you said of, of the parishes, most reunions, and whenever we get together as groups, the parishes always go together. You know, they're sort of, uh, they're sort of the link, especially in the, and that may be true only in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, I'm not sure. But, you know, like recently we found all the report cards for the Catholic schools that were on their way to the dump at Central and now they're downstairs. And, but my point is, people associate with the parish before they associate with anything. Right. You know, they say, right. you're from Nicaea and you're one of the rich kids, you know, or something like that. But that's, that would be a good way to pursue the history, you know, of, of Butte. 
and neighborhood centers come and go, restaurants, bars, those sorts of things come and go, but the parishes are there, and, they, they, and, and for the most part, they, they stay there. And so, um, so yeah, so they're big, you know, people's identities are very closely tied to, to the parish, yeah. The, the other thing that shouldn't be discounted is they were excellent miners, because, the, and, the, and that, that's a reputation as, as good as religion here. Is. Right. When you, were a, when you were a good miner, you had the respect of like you talked about uh, uh, where your family was, it was the same. If you had the respect of being good miners, that you were up there. Yeah. Yeah. So I think actually the, the two the two institutions that I think were sort of the levelers in this town were the church and the mines. Clearly, so uh, so it was your your place in the church, your place in the mines. They you know that basically made you a part of the community, and so. Uh, I, I think that's why the Mexican community was well integrated, because they were both faithful to the church and also very good miners. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. You talked about the church affiliations. What were the mine? What mines did your parents affiliate with? All of them. All of them. Okay. I think the McQueen and Meaderville people went, worked mostly in the winter, which was right there. Didn't they stay close to the mines, Jim? It, 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 they stayed close in the early days, and, and later as they consolidated mines, they yeah. were all over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was interested to hear from Leo this morning that uh, that her uh, her your father right used to work in many many mines all across the city. Yeah. yeah. Him a card. So he had a, like a punch card or something. Yeah. Yeah. They would process him at a different mine. Right, so constantly. constantly. So he was assigned to a different, uh, maybe, was he doing the same job in, in each one? So it was different work in different mines all around the city, yeah. Yeah, my dad worked in all the mines. It's interesting. How are we doing for time, Ellen? Well, we are great. You know, I'll follow up on that uh, mine thing when I was doing some research on the Mexican community. When they came out of the Kanea mines, they went to work in the Belmont and the Mountain Kong because they had real hot temperatures there yeah. and they could work easily in those hot temperatures, which uh, made them very, um, very popular in those hot mines. And that would be in the 1920s. Right. So, um, but and there was actually, in, there was an, in a, a, a comment in one of the oral histories that the the bosses actually preferred these Mexican hard rock miners to coal miners from the Virginias, or because they, they were used to you know those conditions, uh, you know the right. conditions that were you know Butte's conditions. Right. When I was here, first here, I noticed that the Mexican men that I met tended to be contract miners, and I think that might be because they were so good, you know, they were great miners and they could make more money working for themselves. And when, what decade was that, Frank? That I'm trying to date you, too, so. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been in the late 60s. Late 60s, OK. Yeah, that came out in world history. So yeah, the contract miners, yeah. yeah. And one thing I, that I was always very vivid in my mind was the change of shifts. Oh, my gosh. I lived on South Main, uh, 600 block. So, uh, as you look up the hill, you know, when it was time for the change, and hordes of men would walk down. The whole world was coming down that yeah. street. And yeah. then they'd kind of separate when the bars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so amazing to watch this, this change, yeah. you know, and then you always knew because there was a bell that you could hear all over Buick. Right, right. right. Well, well, the contract might have would move yeah. because sometimes there was two to four partners or his contracts or bosses moved to different places. Uh, they, they would request the miner to go with them and they'd get a better place or a good place or better equipment. There was, there was a lot of reasons to move and maybe they'd be trying to extract different ore, zinc or copper or manganese and as that became the criteria. They, the, the company actually <coughs> the men to get the production up, and, and the contract miners was the key to get the production up. Right. Well, folks, um, I, uh, I 
I don't know that I've contributed much to this conversation, but it's certainly been a pleasure to be here. Thank you for, every time I come to Butte, I learn so much, and it's, uh, you guys are wonderful. Uh, thanks for having me, and uh, enjoy your weekend. Enjoy this wonderful institution. Ellen, I don't know if you have anything else to say. No, thanks for coming, and thank you, Raphael.